an early game for the 49ers and Seahawks this week coming up on Saturday, and it is already here, a crossover. 49ers, Seahawks for the third time wild card weekend style coming up on this episode of Locked On 49ers and Locked On Seahawks. You are Locked On 49ers, your daily San Francisco 49ers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to another Locked On Podcast Network crossover episode. Brian Peacock of Locked On 49ers here with Corbin Smith of Locked On Seahawks at BD Peacock at Corbin. Uh, Corbin, l- let the folks know what you're I'm, – I'm drawing a blank on what your, your Twitter handle is right now. At Corbin Smith NFL. NFL, that's what – yeah, Corbin Smith NFL. I was like, is the NFL in there or is it not? Of course it is. Covering the NFL, obviously. Uh, doing great things is Corbin Smith with Locked On Seahawks. And I can't believe we're doing this thing for a third time. Of course, we're going to get into the biggest storylines, the key matchups, and make some predictions for wild card playoffs here in this Locked On Podcast Network crossover episode. Today's episode is brought to you by – Prize picks and all crossover Thursdays are presented by our friends at Prize Picks. Prize Picks is so much fun and it's easy to play. No competing with other players, just you versus the projections available. Pick two to five players. If they score more or less than their prize picks projection, you can win up to 10 times your money on your entry. It can literally take less than 60 seconds to enter. It's that easy. We love prize picks. We know you will too. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. That's pricepicks.com, promo code locked on. Biggest storylines. Biggest storylines is that, man, uh, I don't know how it happened, but the Seattle Seahawks snuck in there with that seven seed. It was the 49ers uh, that, that clinched against the Seahawks earlier this season. And, you know, it was all about seeding for the 49ers, but we weren't sure exactly who the 49ers were going to see if they ended up with the two seed. Uh, if I was going to be the Green Bay Packers, but it was those. Uh, Detroit Lions that, that came through, knocked the Packers out, allowing the Seattle Seahawks to get in here. And part three, 49ers, Seahawks. Corbin, what's been the biggest storyline for you this week coming into this game? Well, as you just mentioned, just simply being in the postseason, I think when you look back at that matchup in week 15 when the 49ers came to Lumen Field in Thursday night football and won that game, it sure felt like the Seahawks had played themselves out of playoff contention, even though they were not mathematically eliminated. They ended up losing five out of six games to start the second half. So it felt like any momentum they had early in the season was completely gone. And yet they've been able to get back-to-back wins to close out the regular season. And now going into this third matchup, to me, the burning question going into this game for the Seahawks, can they play a full game against the 49ers without a bunch of self-inflicted wounds because this is not taking anything away from San Francisco. They have played great football in both these games, particularly on the defensive side. This team is number one in scoring defense for a reason, but the Seattle Seahawks have gift wrapped a bunch of miscues that they've done to themselves in both games. The last one at Lumen Field, Quandre Diggs dropped an interception late in the first half that would have really changed the game. The the Seahawks might have taken that back to the house. He didn't have anybody out in front of him, but he had it bounce off of his chest. And then a couple plays later after the 49ers punted, Travis Homer fumbles. The 49ers return it inside the 10-yard line, and they punch it in. So instead of it being 7-3 at minimum at half, it's suddenly 14-3. And then the first game when these teams got together – the Seahawks dusted off their 1920s playbook to put four running backs in the backfield, and they did it two consecutive plays, and DJ Dallas shot put a pass right into the hands of Chavarius Ward in the red zone. That could have made it a one-score game if they could have scored a touchdown there too. So they have had chances, and they have not been able to get out of their own way as much as the 49ers have beaten them in the previous two matchups. So can they play a cleaner football game? Because if they can – This is a team that has proven that they can throw punches with the 49ers, but they've made way too many mistakes against a team that has a superior roster. You can't upset a team when you do that. So they're going to need to play a really clean game this weekend. I think when it comes to the 49ers and the biggest storyline there, uh, we haven't seen, and look, Pete Carroll's a good football coach. I, I, 
I know there's a lot of 49ers fans that are Seahawks haters and don't want to give the, the Seahawks credit for anything and probably hate <laughs> Pete Carroll and don't like him chewing gum and you know, you know whatever it is. Pete Carroll is a darn good football coach, and Pete Carroll gets for the first time he gets the first crack at a coach seeing Brock Purdy for the second time. So that's my number one question coming into this game. I think the biggest story, the biggest story on the 49ers is, and look, into the playoffs when the national spotlight starts to look at fewer teams in the NFL, uh, especially if, if the 49ers start to advance, this Brock Purdy story is going to get huge because this is really unbelievable, especially when you start to zoom out. You're like, wow, what is really going on? Literal, this is literal Mr. Irrelevant that's leading a team into the playoffs, the quarterback. And he is he's leading. He's, he's playing really good football. He's playing uh, such a... A high level of quarterback and it's it's shocking and sometimes you stop and you think it's like what are we watching right now is this real life what is going on um and so is it just that there's no book on him yet and what will pete carroll's answer be after playing him because this is the first time that brock purdy is going to see the same team for the second time and so uh, i'm really i really can't wait to see what pete carroll has up his sleeve and in, in how to defend the 49ers uh brock purdy edition here and, and getting a, a second crack at him and I don't know if you noticed anything watching the first game that you thought about Brock Purdy or the, the second game, which was the first Brock Purdy game. How did you feel about Brock Purdy and that 49ers offense from your perspective watching the Seattle Seahawks take them on? I thought that out of the gate, he obviously started red hot. I think he completed his first 11 passes, but the Seahawks did make some adjustments. And even though the pass rush wasn't there, that's been a huge problem in both games against the 49ers. San Francisco's done a great job. It hasn't mattered who's been under center with the three different quarterbacks that have played in those two games. The offensive line has kept the quarterback clean for the most part. But when the Seahawks were able to get a little bit of pressure on Purdy, he did uncork some bad throws, including that one I mentioned to Quandre Diggs that I'm telling you that was a game-changing missed opportunity for the Seattle Seahawks there. So not just the fumbles and the interceptions and muffed punts in the first matchup between these two teams. Again, so many self-inflicted wounds, but they've had chances to create turnovers, including in that last game, and they haven't been able to execute and finish those plays. So I felt like he showed some rookie cracks in the second half of that game, and the Seahawks defense was able to take advantage. A couple of the big plays they gave up, you know, you don't want to take anything away from Brock Purdy because he made the plays, but busted coverages against self-inflicted wounds for the Seahawks when they were assignment sound they were able to keep the receivers and tight ends fairly bottled up and you started to see Purdy press a little bit it didn't impact the final outcome because the 49ers played great football and they ran the ball well at the end of the game but it does feel like this is a that to me that is a very fascinating storyline because Pete Carroll He's got a history of being able to adapt to quarterbacks when he's seen them multiple times. And this will be the first time that Brock Purdy has had a defensive coach at that matter, like Pete Carroll, with a second crack to look back at what worked, what didn't in that first matchup and try to craft a game plan to really exploit any flaws, especially with him being a seventh round pick starting a playoff game. And it's been pretty remarkable with with Brock Purdy because you know he's made some mistakes, but I mean you see Josh Allen make some mistakes and some really yep. bad boneheaded and interceptions and things like that. We haven't even seen that from Brock Purdy yet. Like at some point, where I'm, I'm kind of waiting to see like where's that really big rookie mistake? We just haven't seen it, and it would probably be pretty devastating for Brock Purdy and the 49ers if all of a sudden that happens, you know, in the playoffs, especially in the first round of the playoffs. Um, but it happens, it hasn't happened yet, and, and it's such a remarkable story, and we'll see if that story can continue past Saturday in the first round of the NFL playoffs. More key matchups coming up in this game with the Seahawks and the 49ers. We'll make some predictions as well. Today's episode of Locked On 49ers and Locked On Seahawks is presented by Bet Online. And of course, you can double digits, by the way, 10 points. The 49ers are favored at home against those Seattle Seahawks. You can find that line and many more at betonline.net, your number one source for sports betting, information, stats, news, and analysis this season. Of course, all of the wild card lines you can find for the NFL. There's tons of draft props that are starting to pop up. Uh, who's going to be what quarterbacks will be playing where in the off season, which coaches are going to be coaching where in the off season. Of course, you've got NBA basketball and college hoops and MMA and boxing and uh, motorsports, esports, and you can find some Vegas style casino games as well 
at Bet Online, and make sure you go get informed at BetOnline.net before you make your bets at Bet Online. And if you love sports podcasts, and I'm sure you do, you can find those as well at Bet Online. Always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting information. Head over to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more at Bet Online, where the game starts. Pretty excited about our next sponsor, Ultimate Football GM. And if you, like me, have ever dreamed of being an NFL GM, managing your football franchise from start to finish through all the ups and downs of a season, hiring the right coaches and coordinators, trading players, making draft picks, navigating your franchise through uh, the season, leading your team to glory, building that dynasty roster through free agency and the draft every single season, all the ups and downs, and even some other things that you don't expect that pop up during the course of an NFL season, all in a challenging and realistic game world. You can do it with Ultimate Football GM, completely free and playable offline. Play on the go as you want and when you want to. I'm having a good time with my Ultimate Football GM franchise in year two, turning things around from a pretty lean start roster-wise, uh, which makes it really challenging and a whole lot of fun. And Locked On listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using promo code Locked On in the game store. That's promo code one word, all caps, Locked On. Download the game. Just visit ultimate-gm.com or look it up on the app stores. That's ultimate-gm.com. Ultimate Football GM. Start your dynasty today. You mentioned the the matchup up front, and uh, I've got to give credit because, like, you know, there's Brock Purdy and there's Christian McCaffrey, and there's so many aspects of the 49ers team. They've got a lot of stars on the roster, and uh, they were nearly the one seed in the NFC with their 10-game win streak. So there's a lot of things to talk about with the 49ers roster, but you mentioned something that's really important, and the 49ers offensive line has been playing great. They've been creating space in the run game for not only Christian McCaffrey, but his backups and Jordan Mason's six yards per carry on the season. And so is Elijah Mitchell, even though they don't have nearly the volume of carries that Christian McCaffrey does. They've been opening holes. They've been doing a really good job of protecting Brock Purdy. And to me, that's one of the biggest matchups in this game is, is up front. And, and most NFL games are one up front. And the 49ers offensive line is really coming into their own, especially Mike McGlinchey on the right side. He came back from a really nasty quad injury this offseason, and he had his hiccups early in the season. He's been playing really well. There's the young guys inside uh, at guard. And so, uh, and, and really, Brock Purdy is, is a lot like Jimmy in that he gets the ball out pretty quickly, knows where to go with it, and gets the ball out to his playmaker's hands and lets him go. Um, he can, he has a little athleticism to get on the move a little bit as well. And I would say one thing, maybe Brock Purdy that, that you could do is, is somewhat try to take advantage of him, maybe bailing out of the pocket a little bit too early. And while he's athletic and, and he can move around and maneuver in the pocket and create some space and make a throw, he's not fast, fast, and he's not going to outrun people. So I wonder if there's sort of a, a zone blitz situation to take care of a, a quarterback like that, where you muddy the picture at first, then if he gets skittish, now you've got somebody, a fast linebacker that's got eyes on him to chase him. And, and we've seen um, him run into a little bit of trouble with some of those things, but I'm kind of getting uh, off topic here. My key matchup here is up front with the 49ers offensive line against that defensive line and protecting their quarterback. Because if you don't force Brock Purdy into any mistakes, I just think the 49ers are too talented. If they're not making mistakes, I'm not sure where the path to victory is for the for the Seahawks in this game. So where's that pass rush going to come from, from the Seattle Seahawks, Corbin? You know, it's interesting because if we had this conversation three or four weeks ago, I've been saying, I have no idea unless Lieutenant Nuosu was going to erupt with a couple sacks. He was really the only guy that consistently was generating pressure. But then the last couple of weeks playing a New York Jets squad, that's got a pretty battered offensive line, a bunch of former Seahawks in the tackle positions. And then this past week, the Rams, you and I both know their offensive line was a huge problem this year. It's part of the reasons they got in the situation without Matthew Stafford being available because they got him hit too much and ended up getting hurt. But that being said, Daryl Taylor has really come to life the last several games. Ended up finishing the year with nine and a half sacks, tied with Nuosu for the team lead. And they've got a rookie in Boye Mafe. I'm telling you, Brian, the stats don't suggest it because he's been pretty quiet rushing the passer this year. He just hasn't had a lot of chances. They have used him a lot in run defense situations, and he's been a revelation there. One of the few guys that has consistently been able to set an edge and stop the run, but he's been getting after the quarterback too. So I actually think the Seahawks have some momentum in that regard, but I love that you mentioned zone blitzing and just sim pressures in general because that was where the Seahawks did have a little bit of success 
with the few times they got some pressure on Brock Purdy in the second half. And I don't think Clint Hurt's going to be wanting to blitz a ton because that's not his style. And there's too many weapons on this offense and the skill positions for the 49ers. But I look at somebody like Ryan Neal, who they're expecting has a chance to play this week after missing the last three games. Or if Jonathan Abram plays for him, Abram's kind of got a little bit of a Jamal Adams light skill set where you can play in the box and you can blitz him. They've got a really good corner in the slot in Kobe Bryant that had his second sack last week against the Rams. So they can mix and match and do some interesting exotic stuff blitzing. It's not something they're going to do a lot. But I do wonder if that's something that they will do more in this game just based on the opponent because that was when they were able to get a little bit of pressure on Purdy. And he did uncork a few bad throws, a couple of them just inaccurate, the one that Diggs should have intercepted. So maybe they can create a few more of those plays here. As far as Seattle, though, from a defensive standpoint, the matchup that I'm looking at going into this game it revolves around the run game, especially with Debo Samuel being back. And I know the 49ers are not using him as much in that capacity now that Christian McCaffrey is in the roster, is on the roster in the backfield, and they've got Elijah Mitchell back too. But just his dual threat ability mixed with McCaffrey, those two guys, this run defense has been so bad most of the season. They've been solid against the 49ers in the two games with the exception of a couple explosives given up. But that's the issue. All it takes is one broken tackle by either one of those guys, and they can go the distance. And so no Jordan Brooks going into this game. They did okay without him last week. Cody Barton looked really good last week playing the Mike spot. They have Alexander Johnson, a veteran, and Tanner Muse, who's a really athletic former safety that seems to be figuring things out. But without Brooks in this game, that is going to be a huge issue. Can the Seahawks overcome that, especially with how well the 49ers run the football? So Get all those other weapons to worry about, but I'm still going back to the run game being an area of major concern for the Seahawks just with how they played the run most of the season and the Jordan Brooks injury added on top of that. I mean, defending the run is always priority number one if you're playing against Kyle Shanahan, San Francisco 49ers team. By the way, uh, Al Woods, the guys on the interior, are, what's the health status on on those guys inside? Al Woods will be playing in this game. He's been back for the last couple games, and they've been weaning him back in, but he looks like he's feeling pretty good. So they will have at least one big-bodied nose tackle available in this game. Yeah, that's uh, th- that's the idea for every Kyle Shanahan game. It's like, look, if we can run the ball 30 or 40 times, that's good because that means we're in front of the sticks. That also means we probably have a lead and, and we can operate the way we want to. You don't have to put too much on your young rookie quarterback and you know short throws, catch-and-run type stuff. Uh, and, man, the, the 49ers are really healthy at the right time. Elijah Mitchell and Debo Samuel really is the one who's taken a back seat since Christian McCaffrey showed up his his targets even when he was healthy have been down a little bit so uh, I have a feeling though there's a lot more in store for Debo Samuel in the postseason in the playoffs and just the the way that they can move those guys around you put Christian McCaffrey and Debo Samuel on the field how do you treat that? Is it 21 personnel? Is it 11 personnel? You know, like what, what exactly are you doing there? And then you could do the pony look where you, you put them both in the backfield at the same time, and then you could throw passes to them or you could hand it to either one of them. So uh, I think that's what's really exciting about this team coming into the playoffs and with full health. And then of course the Kittle to, or the, uh, the Purdy to Kittle connection has been fantastic as well. And, and really unlocked uh, more of Kittle in the red zone, especially since Brock Purdy took over. So um, I mean, it's a lot to defend, right? I mean, there, there's just a lot you have to worry about. And the 49ers are so positionless in that way on the offensive side of the ball, that if you have that say linebacker who, you know, can't cover, it could be a long day for you. Or if you have, you know, that, that certain, place that the 49ers can go and run the ball continuously behind Kittle and Trent Williams and you can't stop the run there it's going to be a long day so that's why I like the 49ers so much in the playoffs in general and in this game against the Seahawks even though it is the third time and we know that can be difficult yeah you know the familiarity aspect you know, I look at it from the Seahawks offensively another matchup is worth mentioning here Because anytime you're playing the 49ers, just as you mentioned with the run game, you got to worry about Nick Bosa. 90 pressures this season, according to Pro Football Focus. I think half of those have been in the two games against the Seahawks. He has been living in the backfield. He should have been the guy that had the big hit that led to a pick six in that last game. That was not a penalty. I'm sorry. That was not roughing the passer on Geno Smith. But he has been a huge thorn in everybody's side, not just the Seahawks. I do think going into this game, though, if you're looking for a silver lining for the Seahawks, 
that last matchup, Abraham Lucas was trying to play through a patellar tendon injury. It was irritating him. He was not moving near as well as we usually are accustomed to seeing. He's a really athletic right tackle for 315 plus pounds. They sat him out against the Jets in week 17, and he came back last week, and he looked the best I've seen him all season. He was moving really well. He was, he was cleaning up in pass pro, no pressures allowed against the Rams. They obviously don't have Bosa rushing off the edge, anybody close to that right now with the injuries they've got. But still, that was a really positive sign, and I thought Charles Cross played really well the last couple of weeks too. And so they seem like they've finally gotten past that rookie wall, so to speak, and so maybe that gives them a little bit of momentum going in this game, even though this is a matchup that no tackle wants having to deal with Nick Bosa. I do wonder if the health of Abraham Lucas this time around is going to help him be much more effective against one of the best players in the NFL. Yeah, and that's important, and I'm sure he's going to get chipped as well all day long as most teams do with Bosa, and we'll see at times D'Amico Ryans will move him around a little bit, so it's harder to chip him if he's moved around to the interior. You're not sure, sure if he's going to line up on the left side or the right side. Um, and he's going to be defensive player of the year for a reason. Uh, not only did he lead the league in sacks, I was looking at the quarterback hits numbers last week before week 18, and he's almost doubling guys like Micah Parsons in the quarterback hits department. I mean, it's just... It, you you can see why if you're an opposing quarterback playing as the 49ers, you just feel that pressure of someone like Nick Bosa on the other side, even if he's not exactly getting home and getting a sack in the game, you, you feel the pressure. So obviously it's a priority number one for any offense going against 49ers. Make sure you get Nick Bosa blocked so you can operate in the passing game. And good luck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Next, Corbin, let's make some predictions here for wild card game number one, the early game Saturday 49ers and Seahawks next. Are you looking for a delicious treat, but you don't want all the fat and calories? Then you got to try Built Bar. And I've been talking about the uh, the genius of Built Bar for so long here on the podcast, and I don't know how they pack so much flavor into a low-calorie, high-protein treat. It's a protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. How do they do it? I don't know, but I don't really care. Uh, and the best part is they're all covered in 100%, not not all, but most built bars are covered. If you don't like chocolate, you can find a built bar that doesn't have chocolate on it. But I currently love chocolate, and I think most people do love chocolate. So you can find it covered in 100% real chocolate, which really sets off those built bars and makes you feel like you're getting a treat, even though you're eating something that is healthy and actually tasty. Seriously, they're so delicious. You don't, you won't even think they're good for you. They're perfect for those New Year's resolutions, too. By the way, and unbelievable flavors: churro, peanut butter, brownie, coconut almond and in most built bars only 130 total calories and four grams of sugar with a whopping 17 grams of protein and now you don't need to wait around for that box in the mail although you can go to built.com and order yourself a box of built bars you can find them on shelves as well including your local walmart or sam's club that's right head over to the nearest walmart today walk to the pharmacy section grab yourself a box of built bars you can pick up a four box four bar box of cookies and cream double chocolate or coconut puffs and if you're close to Sam's Club, you can run in and grab a 13-bar box of the hit flavors. So thank me later. Go to Built.com to get yourself a box of Built Bars. All right, Corbin. There's something that jumped into my mind here before we get to our official predictions of the game. I think I have a pretty good idea of how this game could go, but the NFL is crazy and it's always chaotic and you never know how things are going to happen. And you think it's going to happen one way, one play early in the game can just change everything. And if you're ahead and if you're behind, it changes the the path of a, of a game and how, and how a game is played and how you're defending a team and, and what part of your playbook is open. But before we get to that, you mentioned Boye Mafe, who I really liked coming out of Minnesota in the draft, and I thought that was a great draft pick. And clearly, the Seattle Seahawks have had a fantastic draft. You got Kenny Walker, a running back, who's you know um, probably right behind Brock Purdy for Rookie of the Year. I'm not sure, but I think like there's going to be an amazing amount of uh, postseason awards combined with these two teams. We're talking comeback players of the year. We're talking rookies. We're talking defensive players of the year and coaches executives of the year like the job that john schneider has done with the trade of russell wilson and all the draft picks that are playing like i don't know who you give credit do you give credit to the coaching staff for coaching up all these rookies and getting them ready to play do you give credit to the scouting staff for bringing in all these players that are playing so well early in the career and i think it's a similar similar question for brock purdy and the 49ers like do you give kyle shanahan coach of the year for 
being the two seed in the NFC with his third string quarterback? Or do you give credit for John Lynch for drafting a guy who looks like he might be the best quarterback of those three quarterbacks that have played for the 49ers this year? So, I mean, just tons of awards that I think are going to be coming both the Seahawks and the 49ers way uh, once those things are voted upon. Yeah, you can look at that rookie class, and it's been phenomenal. And they've got a couple players that have really emerged in the second part of the season from that class. They got a seventh round rookie that you need to know the name going into this game. Derek Young had his freak a freak. He was my guy. I was clamoring for the 49ers to draft him late. In the he season. has an engineering degree, too. This this dude is smart. Like he's got he's got a skill set that you rarely see at the combine. 6'2. 224 pounds, 4440, a sub 69 second three cone, can jump out of a building. He's played special teams. He's played running back. I mean, they're actually talking. There's a lot of fans out there, and I think it makes some sense. They're talking about him being Seattle's Debo Samuel as he continues to develop because going D2 to the NFL is a huge jump, but he has really turned into something the last four or five games. They've been using him some as a fullback, and he's been blowing people up as a blocker. I mean, he's a lot of fun. So just another guy in this draft class that looks like he's got potential to be here and contribute for a long time. And, again, I think you have to give kudos to everybody. John Schneider, the scouting staff, Pete Carroll, his assistants for being able to coach these guys up. And that and Geno Smith, those are the two reasons that the Seattle Seahawks are in the postseason when nobody thought they were going to be this year. That said, Corbin, what do you think? How's this going to go? Do, do you have sort of a, a a story that you could tell about what the path is for the Seahawks to win this football game against the 49ers since the 49ers are favored by by 10 points, which is the, the biggest favorites of Wild Card Weekend? And it's understandable. The Seahawks are nine and eight. They lost five out of six at one point in the second half, although they were in every one of those games. A few bounces, they could have won most of those games. So it's not like they completely unraveled. It's just a young team that seemed to hit a little bit of a speed bump. And Geno Smith hit a little bit of a speed bump. Not all his fault. But I think there's two big keys for the Seahawks going this game. I don't think the separation, if both these teams are playing at their best, I don't think the separation is 10 points. I think the Seahawks gave so many possessions away in the two games between these two teams. And I'm not saying the 49ers are not better because they are absolutely a better team. They have more talent. But the Seahawks have done so many things to aid the 49ers winning those football games that if they can just eliminate the turnovers, that's the first big thing to me. Seattle's been so good at creating turnovers except the two games against the 49ers. Can they find a way to get a couple turnovers and protect the football themselves against this elite defense? If they can win the turnover margin, that's going to be a huge, huge boost to their chances to win this game. And the second big thing for me, they have got to find a way to limit the negative plays on first and second down. They had 30 plays on first and second down then went for zero yards or negative yards or were a turnover in the first two matchups. You can't do that against any defense, let alone San Francisco's. They had an average of third third down and 10 and a half yards in the last matchup. You can't do that against Nick Bosa. He is going to get to the quarterback every time when he can pin his ears back like that. So they have got to be better on early downs and stay on schedule. If they can do that and win the turnover battle, just those two things, I think the Seahawks have a legitimate opportunity to come in and make this game very interesting, if not find a way to pull the upset. Those are two things that are going to be difficult to do, but if they can accomplish them, it gives them a chance to be able to go to Levi Stadium and, and pull off a little bit of a stunner here. It does make me a little bit nervous to say the 49ers are going to walk in and just blow out the the Seahawks, the, a team that they've, they're seeing for the third time this year. Pete getting the is the first coach to get a second chance at Brock Purdy. I do think the 49ers are better. I do have the 49ers winning this one, but I'd put it more like six points than, than 10 plus points. And certainly it could be a blowout. And the 49ers uh, have looked really good against the Seahawks in the, in the two previous games. And I would say the games, you know, last year, a lot of people are trying to draw uh, comparisons between the 49ers not being able to get past the the Rams for the third time in the playoffs last year. And I think those Rams 49ers games were a lot closer all three times than than especially the first game was against the the Seahawks this year. So I do like the 49ers in this game, but uh, it's interesting. And it's not always sexy to talk about turnovers, but it's so important in the NFL. The 49ers were either 12-0 and or 13-0 and this year when they were either even or won the turnover battle. So that, that's absolutely huge. And, and when the other team throws you the ball, you got to catch it. We saw Quandre Diggs catch one uh, to help seal 
the the fate for the Seahawks to get into the playoffs against the Rams last week and uh, drop one against the 49ers. And so sometimes that could be the difference in those are the biggest plays and the biggest tide turners in a game is the turnovers. So 49ers either tie or win the turnover battle. Nothing crazy happens. They should be able to get out of there with a win. But we will see what happens Saturday, 1.30 Pacific time kickoff. In Santa Clara, Levi Stadium, 49ers and Seahawks. I can't wait for this one, Corbin. Always a pleasure chatting with you, everybody. Thank you so much for making Locked On 49ers and Locked On Seahawks your first listen every day here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Find me on Twitter at BD Peacock, Corbin at Corbin Smith NFL. And of course, check out all the rest the network has to offer. The Peacock and Williamson NFL Show daily. Locked On NFL, Locked On Sports today, and so many more. Talk to you next time right here on the Locked On Podcast Network.